this being recorded? Yeah. It'll... All right. All right. So uh, we are going to get started here. Thank you all so much for being here uh, for the launch of my uh, book called The Humane Hope. It's right here. <laughs> Essays exposing happy meat, humane dairy, and ethical eggs. And uh, I, I really appreciate everyone being here. Uh, and I appreciate that we could do this at the uh, conference of the CCOP conference. I actually was at the very first one, I believe, is the very first one, right, Sailash, in Arizona? Yes, many, many you are. Yeah, yeah it's fantastic. Uh, so I'm so glad it has continued and grown. Uh, and uh, so anyway, I'm going to just talk for a minute, and then we're going to be hearing from eight of the authors that contributed to this anthology. There's actually 18 uh, contributing authors, 18 chapters, and we're going to hear from eight of them today, nine including me, I guess. And it's going to be kind of lightning round style to get everyone in. Everyone's just going to have like five minutes, so uh, it's going to be quick. Uh, but, you know, I, I, edited the, I edited this book, but it was a collaborative effort. I couldn't have done it, of course, without these amazing voices, uh, hearing from, you know, different aspects, different uh, angles of this issue. And I, I do want to give a plug really quick to my podcast, the Hope for the Animals podcast now, because right now, uh, Alistair is on that episode and they talk more, Alistair Van Cleek, who you'll hear from in a moment, they talk more in depth about their chapter there on my podcast that's uh, out right now. And then also coming up in May, uh, on Monday, actually, I'm going to be releasing the next episode and we'll have Nicholas Carter on. And Nicholas Carter wrote one of the chapters in the greenwashing section. We're going to be debunking like regenerative grazing and grass fed. So that's going to be very informative. And then also Lisa Barca is who wrote a chapter uh, called the uh, Humane Myths and Media and also co-wrote uh, uh, the chapter with Silesh will be on the podcast as well coming up soon in May, later, later in May. So we're really going to get in depth uh, on the podcast. So I encourage you to uh, listen to my Hope for the Animals podcast for some more in-depth uh, coverage of the book. And I also want to thank uh, Lantern Publishing and Media. I'm so grateful to Lantern for believing in this project, for publishing this book. Lantern has, uh, they've offered a $100 gift card to their online store that we're going to be giving away in just a bit. And I'm just, I'm, I just want to say I'm really grateful that people still read books right? With all the kind of like short, quick social media now, the, you know, just fast, fast memes, videos, TikTok, it, it warms my heart that people still sit down with a book. And I think that it's a way to really connect more deeply with a subject, to really embody the feeling of a subject, you know, beyond kind of the momentary meme. So I'm just, I, I feel like there's a great deal of power in books and I'm so excited to get this one out far and wide. Uh, it's now been 10 years since I wrote my first book, The Ultimate Betrayal, Is There Happy Meat? And this issue has just grown. It just it's, it's resonating with so many people now, so many activists. Alistair and I started the Humane Hoax Project to get the message out. Uh, so, and, and I just decided that I wanted to really amplify this issue. So I started collecting essays for this anthology. And that was like long before the pandemic. This has been going on for quite a while. Uh, the, the, the pandemic put publishing back. So it's just been this long, long process, but it's finally happened. I'm thrilled and excited. And I really see this issue as our 21st century challenge, right? The labeling and marketing, it's just going to get worse. I believe it could undermine our efforts to see a world free of, you know, farmed animal modification and killing. So it's just this critical, critical issue to educate on. And I hope very much that all of you that are here uh, will be ambassadors for this book, will promote this book, buy one, buy one for your local library, share on social media. Uh, you know, we, oh, and this is the big one I want to ask is please, please, please write a review on Amazon. You don't even have to buy the book on Amazon. You can buy the book directly from Lantern, but at least leave a review. Give a five-star rating and write a review on Amazon. There's not many reviews right now, so we really, really need to bump up those reviews on Amazon. So I'd appreciate it if everyone could do that for me. 
Okay, so let's do some giveaways before we're going to hear from everybody. We got to jump in here. So I'm how we're going to do this is we're going to use the chat. So find the chat feature, and we are going to uh, let's see. I'm going to find the chat feature, and I would say that the the authors and speakers today are disqualified. You're going to get a free copy of the book. So, <laughs> uh, but everyone else. Uh, find your chat feature and I'm going to ask a question and the first person that types into the chat is going to win first a copy of the book that we're going to give away a copy of the book. So get ready, <laughs> get your typing fingers ready. And the first question is, oh, what is my first question? I, I tried to make these fairly easy. Uh, the first uh, first um, book uh, question is, what year did my first book come out? I kind of said it already. What year did my first book come out? Anybody? Do, 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 do. Uh-oh, this might have been too hard <laughs> a question. <laughs> um, okay, well, maybe I, I said my book came out 10 years ago. There's a hint. Anyone is, oh, oh, wait a minute. I'm not seeing them. Okay. So, oh, here we go. Jeez. I, I, there was all new messages. Hello. Okay. So the very first one was Joyce Lippner. Joyce, you win. Woohoo. I'm going to put my email in the chat and then you email me your address and I'll send you a copy of the book. All right. So next, the next question. Thanks for everyone that I totally didn't see all these. Uh, <laughs> um, okay. So Next, we got to get into the people, but one more quick giveaway. This one is a big one. Lantern has been so generous to give us a $100 gift certificate to their online store, which is really, really kind of them. So now for the next question, uh, let's see, what was my other question going to be? Oh, right. How many contributing authors are there to this anthology? Good desert. Desert Doberman. Wait, was it Doberman? Yes, Desert Doberman. Good job jumping in 18. I had said it. I tried to use questions that I said that I just said the thing. Anyway, <laughs> all right. Thank you all so much. Um, I hope that was fun. <laughs> and I hope that uh, those that that uh, won in, uh, enjoy your prizes. Okay, we're going to jump in now. Here we go. There's four parts to this book, and I have representatives from each parts, each different part of the book. And the first part is called Humane Washing. So we're going to first hear from Alistair Van Cleek. Uh, they are the co-founder of Tri Triangle Chicken Advocates and the Micro Sanctuary Movement. Their chapter is called The Terrible Truths of Backyard Chicken Farming. All right, Alistair. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, yeah, I'm Alistair Van Cleek. I'm the co-founder of Triangle Chicken Advocates, as well as the Micro Sanctuary Resource Center. Um, and uh, my chapter really talks about our firsthand experience of doing uh, rescue and caregiving at our sanctuary for um, victims of backyard chicken farming. Um, and one of the reasons why the Humane Hoax is such an uh, important topic for us and why I worked with Hope to get the Humane Hoax project started was because we have so much experience um, seeing the realities of backyard chicken farming while also hearing people tell us about the myths about backyard eggs um, and, and keeping backyard chickens. And so for us, it was a very clear, you know, uh, uh, paradox between the way these people actually treated their chickens and then the way they talked about their chickens and the way they talked about the eggs that they were consuming. Um, and so for a lot of people, backyard eggs are kind of sectioned off from the rest of animal farming as these things that are, you know, they're, they're okay. Um, we kind of have other, you know, other forms of cruelty and exploitation to deal with and the backyard chickens are okay. Um, but we really wanted to try to, to tell stories of our residents and kind of show how these myths are, are very not true. And they actually kind of, um, you know, serve to mask a lot of, of exploitation and suffering uh, on, you know, that the, the chickens go through at backyard chicken farms. Um, so I tend to talk about backyard chicken keeping as backyard chicken farming um, because it really is a type of farm. Um, and I and we try to steer people away from thinking about farms as this one type of thing that looks a certain way, whether that's a chicken shed, you know, at like an industrial scale farm 
or something big with pastures and things like that, like out in the country. Um, because a lot of the, the industrial practices that go on in the larger scale farming are also at play in backyard chicken farming. Um, and so what I try to do in my chapter is I kind of start out talking about one of our residents whom we rescued in 2014 uh, named Bibi, who was a little hen who survived a raccoon attack at, the, um, at a backyard uh, like chicken uh, keeping location. And um, you know, we kind of tell her story about how she was injured during this attack. And when she came to our sanctuary, she was able to recover and really started to kind of come back alive after she started to interact with other chickens again after spending you know, some time on her own. Uh, after the attack killed her, her um, three sisters. And so um, from there, um, I try to talk about uh, kind of the realities of backyard chicken farming, including, um, you know, from the very beginning, it, how most chickens at backyard chicken farming setups are usually coming from industrial hatcheries. Um, so there, it's not like, you know, a mother hen is raising chicks in most cases. And, and for, for most of them, you know, um, uh, the chicks are being purchased and, and either from farm stores or sent through the mail. And those all happen at, you know, like industrial setups at hatcheries. And then in addition to that, um, I talk about some of the health problems that chickens experience frequently due to selective breeding for um, very unnatural egg production. So the wild ancestors of, of the modern chickens um, uh, only laid, you know, somewhere between like 10 to 20 eggs per year total. And nowadays, uh, modern domesticated lame breeds are laying as many as 20 to 30 times that per year. And so that's why um, uh, reproductive disorders are the number one killer of uh, laying breed hens. And that's all due to selective breeding. It has nothing to do with the conditions they're kept in. It has nothing to do with how well they're loved or not. It's all about their biology and the way that we've bred them to be, you know, these high prolific egg producers. Um, also really focus a lot on roosters. Um, for us, we love roosters and one of our biggest, you know, uh, efforts as a, as a sanctuary and rescue is to help roosters who have been abandoned um, and, you know, kind of um, need to be gotten rid of. And so I tell the stories of different roosters that we've rescued and uh, including um, the way that uh, we, we've been able to socialize roosters so that they can live together. Um, and it's very, it's very fun to watch roosters uh, you know, once they get here, kind of start to acclimate to us and to other roosters and then become, you know, bonded very tightly with other roosters. So we have a lot of like rooster friend groups with two to three roosters who are very tightly bonded the same way that you would think about like a rooster and hens uh, being bonded together. Um, and so um, really just trying to kind of unpack a lot of those myths and talk about the ways in which um, uh, understanding the realities of backyard farming can help us see the speciesism that's at, at the heart of all animal farming. And what I hope is, is that if people are able to kind of talk about the realities of backyard chicken farming in ways that focus on exploitation, we can then see how all types of animal farming, no matter the size or the scale or the aesthetics, how all of it is a form of exploitation that harms um, animals. Wonderful. Thank you, Alistair, so much. Appreciate that and appreciate Thank it. You. Good timing. All right. <laughs> okay, so next we're going to hear from John Sanvanmatsu. John is a professor of philosophy and he is currently writing a book actually called The Omnivore's Deception. His chapter in The Humane Hoax is called Murder She Wrote, Legitimizing the Meat Economy with Femivorism. John Sanvanmatsu. Thank you, Hope. Um, you know, when uh, when Hope invited me to participate in this, I, I assumed there were many books on this subject already, to be honest, and I was shocked that there weren't. And so I just want to say uh, to thank you, Hope, and to say it's such an important volume. And I want to thank my co-contributors, as well as Lantern Books. So we're, we're just given six minutes, so I'm going to speak quickly. Uh, I will try to read a little bit uh, from portions of my chapter, which is appearing in my new book, as Hope mentioned, uh, the omnivore's deception, what we get wrong about meat, animals, and the nature of moral life sometime next year. So this is the there's a version of this chapter in that book. Um, so I got interested in this, I think really back in 2006, 2007, when first Michael Pollan's book, uh, uh, Omnivore's Deception, came out, and then it was followed by uh, Barbara Kingsolver's Animal Vegetable Miracle. And after Kingsolver wrote that book, uh, dozens of women in the year since have written these um, farming memoirs and ranching memoirs uh, about 
leaving the city, going to the countryside to find themselves and to feel uh, empowered by controlling, raising and killing animals. And it's an extraordinarily uh, <laughs> popular subgenre of women's nonfiction, maybe, maybe one of the most popular genres, actually. So books like, for example, Hit by a Farm, Confessions of a Counterfeit Farm Girl, Barnhart, The Incurable Longing for a Barn of One's Own, The Dirty Life, A Memoir of Farming Food and Love, A Girl and Her Pig, One, One Woman Farm, My Life Shared with Sheep, Pigs, Chickens, Goats, Sheepish, Two Women, 50 Sheep and Enough Wool to Save the Planet, and so forth. Camus Davis, the celebrity uh, female butcher, well, woman butcher, um, wrote a book called Killing It. And all of these books have been, been, you know, many of them have been bestsellers and written up and so on. So I'd been noticing the New York Times had been appraising these folks for a very long time. And so um, I, the, my chapter really is about the the role that this uh, discourse of uh, um, femivorism, uh, as the New York Times dubbed it, uh, is helping to shore up the meat economy by providing new modes of legitimation, in other words, new rationales. Because traditionally, as Carol Adams and other feminists have pointed out, meat has always, in the animal economy, has always been legitimated primarily through masculinity, through hegemonic masculinity, right? Um, but so it's there's something very sinister going on. And I think women are kind of the, have become the bridge or the pivot within the locavore movement um, and the new animal agriculture towards a supposedly more kind and compassionate uh, animal agriculture. Uh, Temple Grandin, who I don't talk about in, in this version of the chapter, but I do in my book, is a good example uh, of this, uh, you know, very famous person who is uh, helping to um, uh, legitimate the discourse. Um, so there's a great deal I could say, I, I guess. Uh, let me just read a couple quick things here, give you a, a sense of the way maternal themes and natalist themes are playing into this discourse of these women who are... Uh, raising animals. Um, so this began, as I said, with Barbara Kingsolver's book, Animal Vegetable Miracle. Uh, so I'll just read, maternalism has appeared in these other books too, a theme signaled on the book's covers, most of which feature photos of their smiling authors in mud boots and clutching chickens, lambs, or baby pigs, infant-like to their gingham-clad chest. Quote, we would make babies, Catherine Friend says, in Hit by a Farm, after she and her partner buy a farm in Minnesota to raise sheep. Another author puts a basket of gear and supplies by her back door like a hospital suitcase for a mother in waiting or a midwife preparing for a midnight delivery. So, um, you know, I, I can't read more due to the lack of time, except I want to say this. that So there's all this very pleasant uh, imagery about maternal care. Uh, but then the women um, just express enormously ferocious violence towards these babies that they've raised, uh, some of them with great gusto, like uh, 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 Noel, what's her name, Noel Carpenter, uh, a particularly vicious killer of animals. So my, my chapter really is about trying to explain this, first of all, in terms of what happened to women and feminism, and my thesis roughly uh, is that uh, even though these are very these are professional middle class and upper class white women, uh, you know they've hit the glass ceiling because women are still subordinated to men in our society. You know years after they were supposed to have been liberated, and then I see these um, memoirs and the millions of women reading them as a kind of a kind of uh, reactionary uh, uh, attempt to recuperate women's empowerment or women's agency but it's a displacement onto the animals, this, this kind of frustration and rage. Uh, so they can't uh, you know, stick it to the man, but they can stick it to the pig as it were. And meanwhile, just to close off, cause I know I'm out of time. Um, yeah, so I think the, the, the um, in terms of the meat economy, again, let me just read this last thing. More than a cultural curiosity, the femivore phenomenon has become central to society's efforts to stabilize and legitimate the failing meat economy. By depicting violence against animals as a form of women's empowerment and maternal care, femivorism is providing society with a new set of rationales for maintaining its endless violence against other beings. That's all I'll say. I do want to apologize. I have my family in the, the other room. I, this was a 
uh, I'd already agreed to this family gathering, so I have to go. So I will watch everybody else's presentation later. Um, but thank you, Karen. Uh, thank you, Hope, uh, again. And nice to see some people like Karen and Robert and folks I know. All right. Take care, everybody. Thank you, John. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, go be with your family. That's fine. <laughs> and, you know, this John's chapter and him talking about that, it, it, it just it helps you to realize how wide this is, how many different angles and different aspects to the humane hooks there are uh, from greenwashing to feminism to, you know, so many different aspects. And the next uh, speaker brings in yet another uh, aspect of the humane hoax, and that's Christopher Sol Eubanks. We're so glad that he's here with us. Uh, he is the founder of Apex Advocacy, advocating for collective liberation through animal rights. His chapter is called How Colonization Helped to Normalize the Humane Hoax. Thanks for being here, Sol. Yes, thank you for having me. I'm glad to be a part of this and glad I was able to uh, be here today. So yeah, um, Christopher Eubanks, from Atlanta, Georgia, and I've done a variety of grassroots actions over the last few years and um, organized with several groups from, you know, I guess the Anonymous with the Voice List to the Save Movement and helped to organize our first ever animal rights march here in Atlanta. And, um, you know, that's just a little bit of background about me to kind of give context to, you know, uh, some of the things that I spoke about in this, in this contribution. Um, but ultimately, I began to do activism and not see the amount of diversity that I thought was uh, needed in the larger movement. So I started a, a nonprofit. And, um, and some of the things that I talk about or focus on in my nonprofit were discussed in this book. So I talk about things from, um, you know, the ways uh, colonization has contributed to the idea that there's an ethical way to harm humans and animals and how these systems of oppression work together and support each other. Um, in my contribution, I wanted to discuss how exploitation is uh, ultimately a mindset that victimizes many groups and how when we normalize uh, this thinking, we are feeding into the mindset that allows us to think that, uh, you know, we can humanely contribute to some individual's abuse and exploitation. And I also wanted to discuss how when we see individuals as others, it makes it easier to support oppressing them. Um, so these are like a few of the things that I spoke about in my contribution. And a lot of these things, once again, are ideas and concepts that I speak of, uh, that I focus on with my nonprofit. I have a nonprofit called Apex Advocacy and that, APEX is an acronym for Animal Protection, Equality, Intersectionality. And um, yeah, essentially what we're doing is we're creating a community of uh, advocates of color that care about animal rights. So uh, we intentionally seek Black, Indigenous, people of color that are passionate about social justice work and they care about animal rights. And we invite them into our community where we have about 300 uh, av uh, ad advocates of color in our hub um, and we have communities all over, mainly in the States, but we have some over uh, out of the US also. And we essentially motivate them to collaborate with activists and advocates in our network uh, to stand up for animal rights. And you know, we offer a community, uh, we offer our community a variety of resources and services. So. We have monthly check-ins with our uh, community and we speak about, like we just spoke about the recent climate report and dealing with climate anxiety within our community. Um, so we have monthly check-ins for that. We have book and media club meetings. So we sometimes to discuss articles, books, uh, films, and uh, a variety of things uh, once a month. We have training and fundraising support to support our community also. We teach about how to fundraise for advocates of color to get their campaigns off the ground. And we also support them financially as best as we can. And we have a Slack channel to share job postings and late, the latest updates. And we do in-person meet and greets and a lot more. So, um, but essentially a lot of the 
ideas and concepts, once again, that I spoke about in our organization or in the book is also discussed uh, in our organization and in our community. And I'm, I'm glad that Hope reached out to me to contribute to this and you know share my thoughts because these are things that I've had thoughts about how I could share my perspective, but didn't quite know how to channel them. So um, I hope you all get the book, read it, and read through all the contributions and ultimately see how all of these issues intersect and connect with each other. But uh, yeah, you can always, you know, oh. And don't you have a campaign uh, about a local slaughterhouse or like a, a, a very small slaughterhouse that is in um, a community of color? Is that? Yeah, so we actually recently, well, not recently, uh, about a year and a half ago, we found out about a person slaughtering animals in their backyard and the person lived five or 10 minutes away from me. And um, this was in my community for years and I had no idea about it. And so we took on the we supported the community in the efforts to get this slaughterhouse shut down. So they would kill about a hundred animals a month and it was totally unsanctioned by the county. Um, it was a block away from an elementary school and it's in a black community. It's an older black guy that was doing the slaughtering and he would kill pigs, goats, sheep. And this was under the guise of, I guess, more humane slaughtering or, um, grass-fed animals and, you know, the, these uh, talking points that are used to support animal exploitation. So we actually recently got somewhat of a victory. The county's come down really hard on him and told him that he has to close the slaughterhouse by May 3rd. Um, and yeah, uh, this is the first sign that the community has had that there's some type of resolution. And we just shared that in our newsletter literally the other day. So yeah, that's like the biggest new development in that situation. Fantastic. Great job. Great job. All right. We've got to move on, uh, but thank you so much for being here. Uh, okay. So, uh, and for writing your chapter. It's a wonderful contribution. Um, okay. So we're going to move on now. Uh, the second, or let's see. Oh yeah. The second part of the book is greenwashing. So that those were those chapters were in the first part, humane washing. The second part is greenwashing. And first, we're going to hear from Robert Grillo. Robert Grillo is the founder and director of Free From Harm and the author of one of the only other books on humane washing called Farm to Fable, The Fictions of Our Animal Consuming Culture. His chapter in this book, The Humane Hoax, is called New and Improved, Deconstructing the Narrative of So-Called Better Meat. All right, Robert Grillo. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay. It's great to see uh, so many familiar faces out there uh, and people that I love and respect so much, um, including you, Hope. And Chris, I hope we get a chance to work together more in th this year. Um, Chris and I met in person for the first time uh, at an activism convergence in Chicago uh, a couple of years ago, and we've, ha we've been kind of connected now and then. So I'm um, looking forward to getting to know more of Chris's work. And uh, yeah, so my chapter is essentially a critique of uh, the Better Meat Movement, so-called Better Meat Movement, and specifically a film called Sacred Cow, um, which was finally released three months ago. So when I wrote the chapter a couple of years ago, um, I told Hope that I thought that this film was never going to come to fruition and that the person behind the film, Diana Rogers, who's a leading, who is now a leading meat, uh, better meat advocate, would kind of disappear from the scene. And I told uh, Hope that I thought, you know, maybe I should write something different. And Hope just kept insisting, no, 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 this is this is fine. It's it, you know, it's still going to be relevant. Well, the interesting thing is that the film came out three months ago, and uh, I watched it today for the first time. And, uh, you know, when I wrote the chapter, I, one of the things I led with was that, okay, here's, here's some of the things that I agree with Diana Rogers on, and, and some of the principles that the Better Meat movement actually, I think, get right. And then um, I lead into, however, their arguments about commodifying animals is nothing new. In other words, 
the better the so-called better meat argument has no new or better arguments. Um, but actually, there is something new in this film that I think is really interesting and telling for us, and that is that they are there's an a, 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 a very concerted effort to co-opt vegans and uh, vegan activists, animal rights activists, to believe that that um, better meat is a much more reasonable, um, realistic goal to pursue, even as vegans or animal rights people, than animal liberation or some other goal. And so they they actually really try to seek out i think and speak to vegans in this film and and that's that's an interesting kind of new thing that i haven't really seen in these kind of fooding type of documentaries that we're all quite familiar with um and one of the people that the film features is Lori keith um who wrote uh, who famously or infamously wrote a book called the vegetarian myth and um, she talks about her psychological and, and physiological decline on a vegan diet. And of course, there's a, there's a bunch of fear mongering um, about a plant based diet here. And the book covers animal rights activism for the first time. I, I haven't seen that come in. And so, you know, we cover that in the, in the chapter a bit. But the, the foundation of, of the humane washing. Um, for the better meat position is that eating meat is essential, uh, nutritionally essential, and even wholesome, and can be ethical when, ra when animals are raised right. Um, so the reason why I, I feel strongly about um, the arguing against humane washing and exposing it and doing something about it is because I feel that it is I think Hope alluded to this in her opening statement, but it's the primary narrative of the meat industry and animal exploitation industries in general to try to intercept the narrative away from the vegan narrative or animal rights narrative by saying that um, you know you don't have to you don't have to go that extreme. Um, there's a there's a better, more sensible solution, and it a kindness to animals and respect for the environment can also be part of that. And so, um, so yeah, uh, but the importance of um, countering this backlash, this is part of the backlash from, from society um, to the animal rights, animal liberation movement. And um, the way we counter this is very important because we have to come back with an actually even better argument for why that's flawed. Um, in order to be a successful social movement. And Erica Chenoweth in, in her research into social movements actually pointed out that uh, narrative discipline and having a, a really strong uh, response to the backlash is one of the four traits of a successful social movement. So um, I've decided to really um, figure out not just how to expose it, but how to actually use it in our activism, in our everyday activism um, against animal agriculture. So thank you so much. Thank you, Robert. Uh, thank you for all the work that you're doing uh, in the humane hoax uh, area with your uh, um, focusing in on the slaughterhouses in Chicago and, and uh, really great, great work. Thank you so much. All right, so next we have our gracious host of this entire conference, Silesh Rao, contributed a chapter to the book as well. He uh, co-wrote his chapter with Lisa Barca, who is here as well. Lisa is going to be on my podcast, the Hope for the Animals podcast, coming up in May to really break down her chapter. Uh, so, But we'd love to hear from Silesh, of course, the founder and executive director of Climate Healers. Their chapter was called The Ethical Vegetarian Myth. Yes. Silesh? Good. Thank you so much, Hope, and thank you so much for, for uh, graciously hosting your panel and your book launch on week of 13. So exactly. it's an honor to welcome you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so the chapter I wrote is based on my personal experience because I had the veg ethical vegetarian myth. Uh, I was deeply entrenched in it. I was thinking that and drinking milk was not so bad. In fact, uh, 
uh, I'm actually helping the cow or whatever, all these you know, <laughs> the things that we are drilled in, that gets drilled into our heads, right, when we are children. And, uh, and as a systems engineer, I, I had known about um, local sensitivity analysis versus global sensitivity analysis. And I was looking at basically the impact of dairy consumption and whether it is harmful to the environment or not. And that was the lens I was using for my moral decisions. And uh, then I realized I had been fooled into thinking that uh, dairy consumption is not so bad from an environmental perspective. And uh, that was by doing a local sensitivity analysis on dairy, putting most of the onus on the beef consumer and so that the dairy consumer gets uh, less of the burden, so to speak, for raising the animal. So then uh, I realized that doing a global sensitivity, global sensitivity analysis will show us that dairy consumption is actually the worst from an environmental perspective. So that's what the chapter is about. It shows the, the logic behind uh, what would happen if everyone went to a, being an ethical vegetarian. What would happen to the planet if we did that? And we show that the planet would be completely destroyed today if that's what happened. Because no one would be eating beef and so on. So all this commodification that happens to the animal after we exploit her, um, that is sort of cleaning up after the ethical vegetarians, so to speak. So that's what the chapter is about. And Lisa contributed a, an important section on the feminist perspective for that. And because we talked about both the dairy cow and the egg-laying hen and how the same ethical vegetarian myth applies to the egg-laying hen as well. So, and so thank you again for allowing us to contribute a chapter to your book, Hope, and for editing such a beautiful book. Yeah. Very, very timely. Yeah, yeah. There's a little bit of time. Lisa, did you want to pop in and say something? Oh, yes. Well, I mean, I guess I, I could just briefly comment on, I mean, since Silesh brought up you know the 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 uh, you know the, uh, a, a feminist you know perspective on this. Um, uh, you know most most self-identified uh, feminists are of course you know ignoring um, the exploitation of of um, well of all non-human animals, but particularly you know of female uh, animals right for their uh, reproductive capacities and how we can exploit that you know to gain the, these you know these these commodities um, that are bad for us to consume and I, I've been to feminist conferences where you know people are eating you know eggs and dairy and and stuff and you know I've tr tried to bring things up and um, I met with a lot of resistance but I mean, I mean, just honestly, you know, if, if we are going to um, draw an arbitrary speed, if we're advocating, say, for, for reproductive justice for human women, if we are advocating against uh, sexual assault, you know, uh, for women, uh, human women, which we should be, um, and yet ignoring the fact that these uh, practices go on, you know, that, that that is the foundation, really, of animal agriculture is is kind of the... Uh, sexual and reproductive exploitation of of these female animals, and so I'll just—I know we don't have a lot of time, but I'll just briefly say, as as a woman and as a feminist, I feel uh, compelled, you know, to speak out on that aspect of it. And that it, that was kind of the thing that that pushed me to uh, become vegan. I had been an ethical vegetarian for quite some time, and then in 2017, I saw a video. I don't even know how I came across it of the, you know, the 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 calf, the baby calf being, you know, taken away. Uh, from her mother and I, i'm sure we're familiar you know all of many if not all of us with this you know tragic moment you know where the mother is like pursuing the baby in the, in the cart or whatever until it's you know just out of sight and the baby is so scared and i just saw this and i was like how did i not know this you know how did i not realize this and um yeah that that was it. I cried and then I became vegan and I, I never looked back. So yeah, that's a, that aspect of this. That's, um, I just think really important to me, both politically and personally. Yeah. 
Wonderful. Thanks, Lisa. Thank you for your contributions too in the book. We appreciate you and your sure. writing. <laughs> All right, so we're going to move on now to Joanne Kong. Joanne is a vegan advocate that is recognized around the world. She edited a wonderful volume called Vegan Voices, Essays by Inspiring Changemakers, uh, another anthology, and I was honored to have a chapter in that anthology, and she has returned the favor by having a chapter in this anthology, and her chapter is called Kindred Spirits or Commodified Objects, Disconnect I'm sorry, kindred spirits or commodified objects, disconnection and perception in the humane hoax. Joanne Kong. Hi, everyone. I'm so honored to be a part of Hope's new book. My activities as an, as an advocate revolve around writing, international speaking, and recently I'm using the power of music and the musical arts to inspire compassion for animals. As a pianist, I recently formed a partnership called Vegan Virtuosi with vegan cellist Christoph Wagner. I'm so glad to be in this book launch today with Hope, Dr. Rao, and Dr. Davis. As Hope mentioned, we are all in the recently published book by Lantern called Vegan Voices. So my chapter in The Humane Hoax delves into the ways that mainstream perceptions have led and fed into false narratives that there are humane ways to exploit animals. One of my favorite quotes that I include in the book was written by Michael Mountain. He said, I am not an animal. Over thousands of years, we humans have sought to separate ourselves from the rest of nature to see ourselves as superior and exceptional. We don't even like to be reminded of the fact that we are animals. They are animals, we are humans. As long as we're in denial about our own animal nature, almost any effort to treat our fellow animals with the respect we grant each other is doomed to fail." Unquote. I also point out emotional value, how consumers are misled through marketing labels to feel that they are making ethical choices. For example, 63% of Americans actually believe that free range chickens live outdoors in natural settings, when in fact the birds are often crammed together in horrifying indoor warehouse facilities, suffering from fear, debilitating injuries, and industry standard mutilations. I also felt it was important to share about my own upbringing and how I myself was raised disconnected and distanced from what happens to the animals. In my chapter, I wrote, my upbringing reflects a particular aspect in which the consumption of animals has become culturally celebrated, namely that of culinary excellence. My father, and especially my aunt, had reputations as superb cooks, the latter with a notable reputation in which she was praised as the Julia Child of Cantonese cuisine. I have many memories of Chinese dishes intricately and meticulously prepared and admired. Shark's fin soup, chicken feet, beef tongue, chrysanthemum fish balls, red cooked pork, pig's feet, and more. In this cuisine and many others, there is also the idea that lesser consumed animal species, lamb, duck, squab, baby goat, and octopus, for example, are delicacies, special treats to be savored with the senses. It is indeed disturbing to realize the perceptual disconnect taking place here the brutal killing of a kindred being has come to be disguised as culinary art. I look back with shame at the fact that my younger self did not possess the awareness to realize whose body parts I was consuming. Yet I hope it provides me with the necessary perspectives to help others on their vegan journey and to do it in a way that is positive and not judgmental. I know that this book that Hope has put together and all its contributing writers will make a difference 
by raising compassionate awareness and motivating consumers to critically examine the consequences of their food choices. I conclude by writing the following. Ultimately, ending the humane hoax will only be possible when we make the choice to abandon the practices of food production that are rooted in suffering and the violation of every animal's desire to live. While we are making progress, the task is a difficult one. What is called for is a true revolution of the heart, rising above material self-interests to a new, deeper spiritual awareness. This is not some vague notion. In truth, it is a movement of our collective consciousness towards seeing ourselves in all others. It's a new perception in which boundaries and divisions no longer separate us and a higher level of caring for ourselves, animals and the planet is grounded in the knowledge that we are all connected. Thank you, thank you everyone and especially Hope. Thank you, Joanne. Uh, it was beautiful. All right, we're going to move on to our next speaker, Karen Davis. Karen is, of course, the founder and president of United Poultry Concerns, the first ever organization to focus on chickens that includes a sanctuary uh, for birds in Virginia. And her chapter is called Humane Eggs and Happy Wings, a look behind the labels. Karen Davis. Oh, you're muted, Karen. Karen, you've got to unmute. Unmute. How's that? There we are. We can hear you can now. You hear me? Yeah. Okay. I didn't unmute myself. I think you unmuted me, didn't you? Somebody did. It wasn't me. But anyway, um, I'm delighted to be here. And of course, um, I share everybody's uh, gratitude to you, Hope, for uh, putting this book together and uh, for not for persevering and uh, continuing to get it to where it had came to fruition. And uh, it's a wonderful enterprise to be a part of. And I'm very grateful. So I will just uh, plunge into a few things here. Um, I'm very fortunate to be here uh, on the eastern shore of Virginia, uh, not because it's the largest poultry producing area in the country and considered the birthplace of the broiler chicken industry by the industry. Uh, however, we do have a nice 25 acres here for our sanctuary uh, for chickens. We have roosters and hens, we have a pea hen, and uh, we have one wonderful uh, female duck. So I'm surrounded by chickens as I sit here and talk. And uh, actually on Thursday was the first day this year that I have gone outside in the afternoon and decided I was not going to sit at the computer anymore. It was a nice day and I went outside and I sat on the back steps, the, the brick steps with our chickens. And um, it's one of the things that's just so nice is, you know, when you walk out the door, of course, the chickens will run from here and there, uh, uh, believing uh, with justification often that you have some nice treats for them to scatter about. But once they realize that, uh, in this case at least, that wasn't going to happen, um, they either go back to what they were doing or they will come and sit around you and they will just sit quietly and, and contentedly. And it's just such a privilege, really, to have them with you and just to see how sweet they are and, and how friendly they are and how much they enjoy their lives. Now, one good feature of our sanctuary is that in 2014, we enclose 12,000 square feet so that our birds have access to trees, bushes, everything is predator proof. So we get to see our birds jump up into the trees at night. Uh, there's a lot of commotion <laughs> at night and uh, uh, get settled into the trees and to uh, sit in the bushes at night. And of course we have houses they can go into if they wish. Um, and they choose sometimes uh, the branches, sometimes they choose to go into one of their houses, but you get a chance to see what chickens will do if they have an environment 
that is uh, stimulating to them in the form of trees, bushes, soil, all kinds of plants growing, everything. So it's really a wonderful opportunity to be able to be with them and to speak with um, a greater authority when you actually know those for whom, uh, on behalf of whom you are speaking. And you spend every day as I have since I met my first chicken in 1985. So I really have gotten to know chickens well, and I have the deepest love and respect for them. Uh, the chapter that I uh, contributed to um, uh, the Home Humane Hoax Anthology, uh, first of all, back when I started United Poultry Concerns in 1990 in Maryland, one of the uh, uh, first things we did back in the early 90s, I and uh, three of our staff people, was to visit two so-called cage-free operations in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. Lancaster County is a huge egg-producing produ county. Uh, it's an Amish county, um, not only Amish, but it's an Amish county, and um, uh, egg production and animal production is a very big uh, uh, production there. Uh, so uh, we managed to get uh, visits to uh, a huge egg um, uh, producer named Souders, S-A-U-D-E-R-S. -E they are uh, an enormous battery cage hen operation, and they also have a niche uh, market for uh, cage-free. Uh, hens. I never say cage-free eggs because eggs can't be cage-free. Only a hen can be cage, uh, uh, cage-free or caged, as the case may be. But um, so we uh, we visited Souders, and we visited um, another place around the same time in the early 1990s called the Happy Hen. And um, a phrase from Bill Moyer of the Happy Hen that uh, has stuck with me ever since. Um, he's when I asked about the really terrible condition of the hen's feathers, how much bare skin. This was again a, a cage-free operation where the birds are locked up for life until they're sent to slaughter um, or slaughtered on the property. property um, uh, but they're not in little wire cages. But notwithstanding, they were so crowded, they were almost on top of each other. And I made a comment to Bill Moyers, well, you know, why do these, I mean, I already knew the answer to that, but I said, well, you know, why are these hens so, uh, uh, so why do they have so, such, so much bare skin and, uh, and why are they so featherless? And he laughed and chuckled and said, well, we have a saying in this business, the rougher they look, the better they lay. The rougher they look, the better they lay. Well, that that phrase that he thought was really cute, and of course we weren't quite exposing ourselves as to exactly what we were about. You know, we were just uh, representing ourselves as visitors interested in learning more about uh, hens who were raised in um, uh, situations other than just battery cages. So he felt freer to be honest <laughs> about how he really felt about things. And so um, uh, I always have thought that is just such a, a kind of iconic attitude that I have encountered in, well, almost anybody in animal agribusiness and poultry agribusiness or, or cage free or whatever. Um, so there was the happy hen and there was souders and they were both very similar, very, very crowded um, uh, living conditions, uh, uh, one square, a square foot and a half or a square foot and less than a half or just a square foot. Um, I have to have you wrap up quick, so. Oh, I will. Um, finally, in the book, I talk about a, a place we learned about by accident in Nelson County, Virginia, a very rural county called Black Eagle Farm. And um, <laughs> this, represent, this farm represented itself as a cage-free, organic, uh, the biggest cage-free, organic um, uh, the farm for hens and, and other animals in, in Virginia. And um, I'm so sorry. People are going to have to read the chapter to get that story. Yeah, we have to, 
I'm sorry. Uh, we still have another speaker and we've just got five minutes left. So we're going to move on. But thank you, Karen. It was wonderful to see you. Please, everyone, read the chapter to hear that story. Okay, so the knack, the, I'm sorry, the last speaker is in the fourth section of the book, and we call that section the spiritual dimensions, because uh, this is an important aspect to me um, as a Jane, uh, and I wanted to have a spiritual connection in the book for, for a couple of chapters, and I'm so glad that Dr. Christopher Miller was able to be here today. He wrote a chapter in that section. He is the co-founder and chief academic officer for Arihanta Academy, a Jane college that I've actually uh, taught a class at as well. And his chapter is called Using the Deeper Dimensions of Jane Ahimsa to Shed Light on the Dairy's, on Dairy's Humane Hoax. So uh, Dr. Miller, Dr. Christopher Miller. Thank you so much, Hope, uh, for inviting me to be in the book, and it's wonderful to be among so many esteemed people in the movement. Um, so I'm Dr. Christopher Jane Miller once again, and uh, Hope is on our faculty, as is her husband. And really, my own journey, I think you asked me at a perfect time to write this chapter because I only recently became vegan and really started to understand what all of the issues are that you're speaking about. Uh, I became a committed what Silesh called uh, ethical vegetarian a long time ago when I was introduced to the Jain tradition. And of course, it can get a little bit weird with any spiritual tradition. Um, things can, certain beliefs can come up, things that aren't scientific or aren't real or don't matter or don't apply. But I didn't find that in the Dharmic traditions. When I say that, I mean the religions that come out of India. I found also a lot of resources for understanding our relationship to the environment, to animals, to one another to everything around us. And my chapter in particular is about a story and it's about one of the founders of this tradition, Mahavira, which means the great hero or the great warrior. He was a contemporary of the Buddha, who many of us probably know. And one day he was sitting out in the jungle or out in the, out in the forest and he was meditating on everything around him, meditating on all sorts of things. And at one point with his eyes open meditating, he has this insight that everything around him does not want to experience pain that everything wants to live from the smallest microbe all the way up to plants, animals, everything, humans. And from this commitment or from this experience comes a commitment to ahimsa. We hear this word ahimsa often in vegan and animal advocacy. It comes from these Dharmic traditions and no other tradition, I think, practices it to the extent that the Jains do. And by default, Jains are ethical vegetarians. We could call them that. And there's an increasing movement within the Jain tradition towards veganism now. And what happened was I was an ethical vegetarian for a long time, kind of blocking out, didn't want to know what was happening after the, you know, or even while the, the milk and everything, the dairy was being produced. And eventually there was a campaign run by the Jane Vegans online. And I had this experience where I was listening to the Jane Vegans advocate for veganism in light of the multiple harms in dairy that all of you have discussed so well today. And that's when my light bulb went off. And it was through this transformative study of this philosophy of Jain philosophy and of yoga philosophy also, as well as being in graduate school and eventually teaching that I had this moment where I thought I can no longer teach this tradition with integrity unless I myself am willing to take the next step and give up the dairy. And I was in Switzerland at the time and I live in Switzerland. So you can imagine that was very difficult uh, at that moment, but I knew I had to do it and I did it. And I try to show others as someone who grew up, grew up eating everything in the American diet, that it is possible, that it is necessary, and that the Jane tradition says that we are responsible for all harm, not just direct harm, for indirect harm, as well as the structural harm that goes on around us. And so I try to emphasize that in my chapter, that we are all responsible for that. And spiritually, for those who want to live a spiritual life, can be quite beneficial for, for addressing our spiritual life this way as well, because the world is real. Everything that happens to animals is real. It's not an illusion as it can be in many spiritual traditions. And, and veganism is one of the major answers to all of our problems as has been pointed out. So I know we're coming to the end, Hope. I'll leave it there and I thank you all for your attention and thank you, Hope. Thank you, Christopher. Thank you, everyone. What an amazing variety and uh, just diversity of voices, and it reflects the book. So uh, please uh, support the book, help us to get the word out, and thank you so much for your support of the Humane Hoax. Uh, and Silesh, any final thoughts? We're kind of at the end. 
we're probably wrapping up, so. Yeah, we do have some time because we are still waiting for our next speaker. So if you want to have a short Q&A, would that be okay with you? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, anyone that needs to go can go of our speakers, uh, that's fine, um, or, or stick around if you can. Uh, yeah, any questions for any of the panel? Go ahead, watch. Oh, thank you, Dr. Rao, and, and great work in by all the authors wow. of the book. My, my question is uh, regarding breaking breaking this myth, because you know it's not just the myth in the community about about chickens, but also the the myth about switching to maybe like an electric car or uh, everybody shouting about get the fossil fuels fuels out. So a, a bunch of these uh, myths prevail or are promoted not only by our media but also by our leaders. So. What's the common thread in breaking the myths? And I'm really glad that Dr. Christopher mentioned about ahimsa because you want to be nonviolent, but you know there are other people who are who have different motivations behind these myths, uh, be it self promotion or um, being popular or you know selling merchandise, what have you. So how do you break these myths? What's the what's the uh, ahimsic method or nonviolent method of confronting these myths so that people can not only have a shift in myth, myths, but also their beliefs and culture. Yeah, I'll just say it, it, it's interesting because one of the reasons that I focus on this issue is that you hear so much from activists that they're doing their work, they're out talking to people, they're doing you know cubes of truth and they're they're talking to people. And what they'll hear from people is, oh, well, my, my eggs are cage free. Well, wait, I get my meat at Whole Foods. So, you know, it, I, it's okay, right? And and that is a challenging moment because, you know, we we want to say, no, of course that's not, <laughs> you know, no, don't you understand? And that's what we have to educate ourselves, I think, as activists uh, to, and what I often will do is I want to acknowledge that people are trying, that they care, that these for that they're seeking out these labels because they care, that they are paying more money because they want to be more humane. And we have to, I think, coming from a place of uh, compassion, living in a, a you know a life of ahimsa, we want to say that's great. That's it's wonderful that you care. You know, thank you so much. If you do care, then let me tell you that actually cage free isn't what it what it you know what it appears to be, or you go into that. So we have to you know acknowledge that people do care. That's the reason these these labels exist. That's the reason that people seek them out, which is great. People want to be more compassionate. They don't want to be part of hurting animals. I think that is a general consensus. So, so now our job is to expose the truth, to expose that there is no humane way to ever commodify and kill an animal. It can't be done. Uh, and we go into great detail in the book about why that is. But does anyone else want to say something about this? Robert. I, I just want to quickly add that, um, I, you know, the approach that we're taking is dominant institution change in addition to you know, a lot of people in our movement are working on outreach to the public, and that's, of course, important, but we also need dominant institution change to really see the kinds of impacts that we, we, we're looking for. If we really want to see a major shift to uh, a plant-based uh, population, mm -hmm. then we have to do the work of a social movement in targeting power holders of our food system in order to bring about um, that dominant institution change that will really bring some dramatic results. But that's the hard work that I think we, we really have to be focusing on, um, like all other social movements do. Yeah. Thank you so much, Ho. Uh, with that, we have to end because uh, I was mistaken. Sue is still, Sue is here. Oh. <laughs> she's, uh, she's under Alex's name, so. All right, all right, yeah. wonderful. Well, thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you for everything. Yeah.